Terrific. Thank you. The, um, uh, I have a number of questions from the audience, in fact, quite a few, and, and they cover lots of different uh, sort of themes. Uh, one of them, uh, and I'll, I'll try to sort of uh, paraphrase a number of them, but thematically, you know, there, there, there are questions with regards to, in terms of companies entering into China, historically, uh, there was a, uh, the belief that there was a need to develop a joint venture partner. Um, uh, Vic, maybe, Victor, you could start off with that, but I, I want uh, Senator Bradley also to comment uh, his experience with Starbucks. Is that so much the case these days? Is there, are there real advantages to developing a local partner or, or not? There's a new trend in China that uh, uh, many uh, foreign investors, they do have uh, more years experience investing in China. So they get learn the lessons that uh, better to have a, uh, ho the wholly owned company. So usually you have to uh, deal with uh, the company politics with the Chinese partner. So if you're strong enough, better to do that. But of course, sometimes in some area, you have to uh, find some strategic local partner in many uh, areas like energy or uh, banking, you know, financial service. So that's what you have to do. But uh, if the policy is open, you can do whatever. So better to have that wholly owned company. And it's easier these days to be able to Yeah, easily to deal with many things. Right. Yeah. And, and Senator Bradley, I know there were some uh, reports recently. Well, um, I suppose any time you enter a, a new market um, that is complicated, uh, the first step is to find somebody that knows the market a little bit better and do a joint venture. Starbucks was not alone in doing that. Uh, what Starbucks found was that uh, there was a level of communication required with the joint venture partner that sometimes impeded the operational excellence of the stores or the way we wanted it done. And so what Starbucks did was to buy out its joint venture partner, for example, in Beijing. And with an all Chinese leadership of the company, the need for a joint venture partner is less, particularly when the all Chinese leadership makes as one of its primary goals being good citizens and developing relationships with the local governments. So um, we found that we like to control our company as opposed to have a joint venture. Um, and to date, uh, it seems to be working. Uh, another question uh, thematically is around distribution of products. And so much of the dialogue and consumerism of China today is around the tier one, tier two cities. And there's a series of questions in and around uh, uh, how does one actually attack and think about uh, the tier three, four, and indeed you know, tier five. And Bill Emilio, you talked about your distribution system. Um, maybe you can comment about uh, strategies that you may be deploying to, to go after those those segments. The distribution network in China, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating. There is a, it's kind of a bifurcated in the way that you have these big PC malls or electronic malls where there could be like seven to ten floors, and when you walk through it, it's kind of bizarre. I mean, there's, a, there's a little spots that you go to, that, and you'll run into one brand, another brand, another brand. And one of the fascinating things I found with our experience in China is we will be in one of these malls, we may have seven or ten stores. You might say, why on earth would you have seven or ten stores in the same mall? I mean, that seems so counterintuitive in any of the other uh, uh, markets that we're in. Well, the reason is, is because they're pretty tight quarters, and when people are walking around, you want to make sure they're going to bump into you somewhere. And there might be, and you might be in any one of these malls, 20, 30,000 people that are going to travel through pretty rapidly. And if they don't get a chance to see your brand, they may miss it. That's one uh, category. There's another category that's now growing, that's the fastest growing category, and that's the large retailers. It's still pretty small, but, but growing very, very rapidly. And those, of course, follow some of the same uh, practices that we see here in the United States or over in Europe. But now moving out is now the, the, the category, how do you get from the tier one cities and now move across west to the, uh, into the country and do it in an economical way? That's when, been one of our major secrets of success is to be able to get a footprint across all of China. And the way we've done that is essentially make sure that we find real estate that's relatively inexpensive, make sure that we're able to get people that we can train and we can essentially put in, in place programs where we uh, essentially train a lot of people. We may not hire them all, but we train a lot of people and bring their skills up in some of the tier seven to tier six cities and get them computer literate. And then some of them we start to hire. And we only have to sell maybe one or two units a week. And all of a sudden that particular store is actually viable. 
And we do a, a pretty interesting stack ranking process on a, a regular basis where we look at all the different stores that we have. We know uh, every statistic you want to know about productivity associated with the store, and we're regularly adding new stores, and we're regularly taking other stores away. And one of the most important elements of success always go goes down to something that I think all of us would know, and that tends to be who is running it, who is the leader. And the, the, if you get good leaders in some of those areas that are running the stores, it's just amazing how all of a sudden you get an operation that just accelerates rates on us. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if the, pr the products already have got a very strong performance in the first tier city, which is very good to develop the second, third, and uh, third, third, uh, third tier city, because usually culturally, uh, the consumers in the in next tier of city will be impacted by the higher level city. Uh, so then you could enhance the service and also uh, the commercials at the low tier level city. Uh, but it never start from the low level. But maybe it's a new newcomer, and uh, you go to the Suzhou, and uh, you start your business in that market. You will never get a chance to come back to Shanghai. So you need to start from Shanghai, then you come back to Suzhou. Second, uh, let's say some products, for example, automobile. Automo of automobile market is developed very well. The core uh, purchases or buyers are young white color, and also self-employees. The cities like Shanghai, like Beijing, which is not the best city for entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is better in the smaller city and the media city. So, so many self-employed and private entrepreneurs, they're in the many media cities in the Zhejiang, Shanghai, Jiangxi, Anhui. So, they are co-purchasers of these new automobiles and many other products. So, that's why if you look at that group, so we really needed to you know, to go to the, those, those cities to provide more convenience for these uh, target consumers. I, I, I like one more comment about, I think it's an important success factor as well, and that's the idea of measuring regularly what's, what's happening. And we were struggling with how to do this, and one of the ways that we came was a very, very uh, interesting and, and simple way to do it. We actually use cell phones to be able to figure out quickly what's being sold in all the uh, remote stores. So when something gets sold, we instantly know with an SMS it gets back to our headquarters and says, okay, this kind of unit is selling in this city, this kind of unit is selling in that city, and we're able to quickly tweak our development process and actually change what we ship out to various, various different parts of the country to meet the taste of that particular part of the country. Hmm. The, um, let me talk price for a moment. Uh, just, Go ahead, just, please. Uh, on distribution, uh, don't make the mistake that the music only plays in Shanghai and Beijing. Because I tell you, uh, with our brands, in, we have stores in Chengdu or Kunming which are doing more than some of the stores in Shanghai. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people used to say, well, in the West, you know, it's going to take a long, long time. I go to Zhongjing, and we got fantastic business there. Okay, so uh, don't make the mistake, the phenomenon of China is not only happening in Shanghai and Beijing, it's uh, much broader. And Bill, uh, Senator Bradley, from a Starbucks standpoint, I know we see them every, every street corner here. Is, is there a day where we'll see uh, Starbucks is down to these tier three, tier four type cities? No, no question about it. <laughs> yeah. No question about it. I mean, if you're not advertising, your store is the advertisement. The people you employ and the people who come as customers. So the more you have, the better you're known, and the more successful you are. So yeah, that's a, a, St a Starbucks on every corner. <laughs> By the stock. <laughs> the, let me talk price for a moment, because there's a number of comments here about price. And um, you know, I think it's widely publicized that the Chinese consumer um, uh, is, is price sensitive. And, and maybe, Victor, you could start off and, and see if you can't weave in a dialogue around uh, the traditionally high savings rates on the part of the, uh, of the, of the Chinese, generally, and the Chinese consumer, and, and, and is that a contributing factor towards uh, uh, their issue regarding price? Yeah, if you divide all Chinese consumer into five groups, high-end, media-high, media, media-low, media and the low. Actually, the media-low and the low occupied about 60%, and high-end and media-high put together is around 20%. So that's why, you know, understand if you look at the national market, it would be a kind of market the consumers basically were sensitive about, uh, about the, the products, uh, the price of the products. 